And the paper I'm going to uh, talk about today uh, refers to Mexico, Mexico's experience. Now, of course, you do not need to know anything about Mexico. You will be experts after my talk, hopefully. hopefully. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to, to give you this paper because uh, I think uh, from Mexico's experience, we may learn important things of both theoretical and uh, practical importance. And I will try to uh, show you some points uh, I would like to emphasize precisely because of the importance in the contemporary debate. Okay, so any, in, in any case, uh, I will tell you a few words about Mexico. It is a middle income e economy, by, by which I mean uh, that it has a relatively important, re relatively important industrial sector. And uh, besides that, it is a very, uh, uh, it is one of the most important uh, exporters uh, of in the car industry. So Mexico is a middle income economy, but it's very, very important from the point of view of a foreign trade. It is among the 10 greatest car producers in the world. Mostly of them are exported. So we're talking about a very particular country which, is, which could not be classified as purely under, underdeveloped. To give you an idea, Mexico's exports are about three times larger than Brazilian exports. So this is a huge ex 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 um, exporter. Now, uh, let me start by, okay. The approach I'm going to use uh, is uh, on, on long, for my analysis of long-term growth. Uh, I, uh, I propose the, no the idea that long-term growth can be understood as depending on three uh, types of uh, constraints. On the one hand, we have the effective demands growth rate, which is I call it uh, uh, RD, which also determines the actual output growth rate because effective demand in any in any moment effective demand determines effective output on the second hand there is a potential output growth rate which is the growth which is the growth rate which could be attained if productive capacities were fully utilized, which is normally not the case, because always there is a large amount of capital which is left idle. And on the third, uh, in the third uh, point is the external equilibrium growth rate, which is the rate of growth of output compatible with external equilibrium. Now, let me go into this uh, a bit more uh, in depth. Yeah. Now, effective demand growth rate. We, I, I am using the Kaleskian approach. I think you, you all studied Kaleski. Okay, so I do not need to delve too much into this. Now, in Kaleski's view, the level of effective demand and output is determined by the global profits and by the rate of profit in output, which is the note here by one mi minus the share of wages into output. Extending 
the uh, definition or, or, or the, the, the equation, the profit equation, as you, can, uh, as you will probably remember, profits in, Kaleski, in Kaleski's view are determined by investment plus capital consumption out of profits plus the budget deficit G minus T plus the trade surplus, the net, net export I, I, X, X, X minus Im, I, imports. Now, uh, is this clear for you or do you want me to go into, bit, into it a, a bit more? So you are well, well aware of this, okay? So, uh, <coughs> and uh, W is determined by uh, the, the, the wage share is determined in principle by the, the profit margin and by the ratio between uh, the mat raw material costs and wage costs. I do not know, you I, I, I think you are aware of that, so I do not need to go into, in, into that too much. Now, if we, if we m put this into dynamic uh, form, and in a very uh, simplified word, so this is the definition of the rate of growth of the effective demand is determined by the rate of growth of investment, by the rate of growth of government expenditure, by the rate of growth of exports, by the wage share, by the input coefficient we might uh, um, convert that into IMY, total, uh, total imports, okay, by the rate, the taxation rate, and by the rate of the um, uh, share of capitalist consumption out of, tot of out of profits, and the derivative of this would be, of course, investment, government expenditure, and export have a positive impact on the rate of growth of output of demand. The way share would have a positive impact also on the rate of growth of demand, and I will come back to this later on. The import coefficient, any rise in the in import coefficient depresses domestic demand, and therefore do depresses output, and uh, the, the same with the rate of taxation, which depresses demand, because it takes money out of the workers, for example, which diminishes their consumption, and the uh, profit uh, uh, rate of consumption, uh, capitalist consumption, out of profits. This is clear. I will go into, 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 into this a bit more. Look, this is relatively similar to the Keynesian expression, to the Keynesian expression which you normally have this is more or less the, no, the numerator of the, of the Keynesian equation. And here I have, instead of what normally appears in the Keynesian expression, which is the, um, propensity, the con propensity to con consume, I have the way share. Now, uh, this equation here is, in fact, also, uh, an, a, a, an accounting identity under certain assumptions. This is valid. This profit equals that is always valid. <coughs> so, uh, if you make the transformations of an, uh, 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 an input-output model, you will, and you assume that worker co workers consume all wages and you take out uh, overheads assuming that all workers are productive workers, 
then you will have this identity always fulfilled. It becomes a theory, however, when one assumes that there is a time lag between the reaction of capitalist consumption and investment on profits. That is, profits are not immediately consumed. Okay? So this is what turns this, what, what turns this, this Kaleskian equation into an equation and not simply uh, an identity. Uh, and this is also this way, the, the, the way share equation, which I'm not showing you here, is also an identity which is turned into a, an equation due to certain assumptions. Okay, now, an important point here to debate is the following. I am assuming that the weight share has a positive impact on effective demand. I am assuming, that is, that if the weight share rises and the profit share diminishes, then effective demand is raised. Why? Because higher wages increase workers' consumption. So this is the reason why I am putting here a positive sign. By the way, this is a matter of debate. There is a long debate, which you might have he heard about, about wage-led growth and profit-led growth. In my, in my uh, experience and the studies I have carried out, I have found that in general, in general, for a, for a series of countries which I have, have studied, growth tends to be wage-led. Anyway, I leave this for the debate. Uh, okay, now. Now, potential output growth rate. Look, we can say that potential output is determined by the total amount of available capital and by the technical capital output ratio. What I am meaning with that? Look, uh, it is how much capital you need to produce one unit of output. This is, the this is a technical definition. It is an engineering definition. It is not what you will find by simply uh, taking the statistical result of dividing available, capi uh, 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 available capital by output. You see my point? So if you, if you do the, the exercise of taking in one column the total amount of capital and in the other column uh, affecting GDP, you are not going to get uh, that. This is technical. The way to measure that is subject to debate, and it, and it is, in fact, very difficult. Now, from this definition, <coughs> I will propose that the rate of growth of potential output, namely the difference between what, uh, uh, effective output in GRT and potential output in year T plus one, this is determined by the amount of investment carried out between in, in year T minus capital which is retired from, uh, which has uh, lost its, uh, its, its use in year T minus, w minus N, say 20 years ago, which is capital which is depreciated, eliminated, okay? 
multiply by 1 <laughs> over k, the technical cap capital output ratio, plus u y, which is this. This is the output which could be obtained if capacities, extant capacities, previously existing capacities were fully utilized. And, well, after certain transformations, we get into this formula, which is the rate of growth of potential output is determined by the rate, the rate of investment divided by the capital output, te the technical capital output ratio, ratio plus u minus a. There are certain assumptions I do, do not need to go into. Is that clear? So we are we are putting one thing in the denominator, which is effective output today. And another thing different, another animal in the numerator, which is potential output, that is output which could be achieved on the full utilization of the productive capacities. OK? Now, and external equilibrium growth rate, which is, uh, you probably are acquainted with this. Uh, this is determined by the rate of growth of export and the import elasticity of output. Okay? This is what is called the third world law, which in fact should be, should be called previous third world law, the first, ma the, fir the first person who put this formulation uh, into, in print was Raoul Pre Previs, the, uh, the, the, the uh, important Argentine economist. This is one possibility of expressing this. And this is uh, one another possibility if we take into account capital inflows which could be obtained. Uh, this will be the rate of growth of the total amount of foreign exchange the country could receive including exports and capital inflows, which in certain countries are important. Now, uh, let, me, let, me, um, let me emphasize one point here. This equation, namely the so-called third world law, is usually understood as a demand effect. Why? Because if exports grows, grow and the import coefficient, if export grows, this expands demand. If the import coefficient or the elasticity of imports grow, this tends to depress demand. Okay? As, as, per, as per equation one, if the input coefficient and m rise, this tends to depress demand. And if um, exports grow, this tends to expand demand. So I repeat, this is usually taken in the post keynesian literature mostly as a demand effect. In fact, this I take it here to be a sub supply effect in the, in the sense that no country can persistently grow with a foreign imbalance. Normally, you will find that growth comes together with growth of exports and with a balanced trade balance. You see my point? Or, uh, or do you want me to repeat that? Okay. So this is, this I take it as a supply side effect, which has to do with avail availability of foreign currency. 
you cannot grow persistently with a foreign trade deficit. You have to have a more or less balanced trade, unless you have a capital inflows. Now, this is the theoretical framework I am using in the paper and in my, in general, in my, in my life, so to speak. Now, let, let us now go from this to the stylized facts we can find in the Mexican economy. Now, look, this is the evolution of the country. This is a GDP growth rate. This is, these are the, out, the numerators of the equation I, I, I am going to, I'm using, referring to effective demand. So we have private investment, which has a rate of growth, which moves, is positive in general, not very high. We have, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, government spending, which was kept in the period I'm discussing, more or less restricted. The growth rate of, GD, uh, of, of government expenditure was relatively low. So government did not play an important role regarding uh, the, the uh, expansion of domestic, of domestic demand. And in the third place, the fastest factor here, this, this, the, 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 uh, uh, these are the uh, ordinates are not, are, not, uh, are not at the same level than the other ones. Export was the, the, the mo export was the most important uh, uh, demand factor. E Mexico's exports grew at a very fast rate, and particularly so manufacturing exports a bit below the fastest growing uh, economies in the world, below uh, China and Korea, but nonetheless extremely fast. And I'm going to come to this point later on. Now, now let's, let us see now the denominator of the equation of the effective demand. You have on the one hand, Look, this is the wage share. The evolution of the wage share, particularly in this period, was negative during the whole period. And the reasons can be discussed, but anyway, this is, this is uh, the, 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 the experience. As you see, this is very low because, not only because workers are badly paid, but also because the way, when, uh, the, the way uh, of the, stati the statistics appear makes it makes for uh, the, um, uh, the informal sector, which is very important, is taken as surplus normally. So it is it is different from the definition which is normally used in Europe because of accounting uh, problems. The rate is uh, not compared, the statistics are not comparable because of the large uh, amount, large share of the informal sector. Now, but anyway, from the point of view of the, the, of, of the analysis of Mexico's experience, uh, as you can see, the wage share decline, which, of course, in my view, in my, uh, 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 from my results, was a negative factor regarding the evolution of demand and output. On the, on the other hand, you have the tax ratio, which also impacted negatively on demand, which rose particularly in this period. And, but the most important factor is here, the imported coefficient, the import coefficient. The fast rise of the important co uh, coefficient was, to my mind, one of the main factors which explains the poor growth of the Mexican economy. Now, this is with regard to effective demand, which was the first equation I showed you. Now, regarding now the evolution of GDP and the productive potential, look, 
This is the rate of growth of GDP. This is the rate of growth of investment, which was low but not particularly low. This is the share of investment in GDP, which went up. Not much, but anyway, it went up. Now, if we were in the purely supply-determined economy, this would have made for a relatively large rate of growth of output, provided the productive capacities had been fully utilized. But look now here. This is uh, the rate of capacity utilization in manufacture. How is this figure uh, obtained? Now, it is relatively difficult. It is extremely difficult to have an adequate figure of the degree of capacity utilization and the degree of, capa of, of, of slack capacity. This is a very difficult figure to come about. In Mexico's, in Mexico's statistics, this figure is obtained by asking managers how much larger could your output be if you used 100% uh, uh, your productive capacity? Or if you use, at the maximum feasible level, your productive capacity. So this is a figure which is more or less true, I think. Anyway, there is an important issue here also, because um, managers are not asked how many shifts they carry out daily. And normally, firms having more than one shift are very few. So. If you, you, if you put your, your, uh, uh, you, you, uh, if you put your machines to work three shifts a day, namely 24 hours, which is technically feasible, you would have an amount enormous of productive capacity available. Understand the point? OK. Now, anyway, the point I want to, I, I want, uh, I want to call your attention to is this. During the whole period, the rate of utilization of capacities was relatively low, which means that during the whole period, output could have been much larger if capacities had been fully utilized, which implies that poor growth of the economy in Mexico's experience, cannot be explained due to a low share of investment. There were problems of investment, but not, uh, of, not overall. There were bottlenecks. There were specific sectors where capacities did not exist. But in general, it was not lack of investment which explains poor growth in the case of Mexico's economy. Maybe some sectoral problems might have been and were in fact important. Okay? This is an important issue which I have long, which I have many times debated and I, I, with my colleagues in Mexico and I must say that n practically no one is, agree is in agreement with me, unfortunately. I hope to convince you in case. OK, now, now let, me, let me now come to the, uh, the evolution uh, of external equilibrium growth rates. Here you have uh, the continuous line is actual output growth rate. And the dot line is external equilibrium growth rates. Now, this is the, the, the evolution of exports. This is the evolution of foreign direct investment, which adds to the uh, rate of growth of uh, external equilibrium. Anyway, this is a minor figure. Exports are about 10 times lar larger than uh, foreign index direct investment. So this, this didn't matter much from the point of view of the availability of foreign currency. 
And this is the import coefficient, which can you, see, you can see grows extremely fast. Now, an important issue appears here. Uh, if we compare, I, uh, this is a point I want to, uh, to put forward as a possibility of a master thesis for you. you might be interested into that. This is, this is a plus you are, you are going to get. Look, uh, in general, if you, if you look at this graph here, in the first part of the period, there is a large difference between output at, extra, at external equilibrium growth rate and uh, effective output. And then they move together. The two of them move together. Now, why? Why is it? Because you, we know that output at external equilibrium does not completely explain effective output because output at external equilibrium does not entirely determine effective demand. Output at, ex as at external equilibrium has on the, is composed on the one hand of exports and on the other hand of imports <coughs> or the import coefficient. And these two uh, do, not, do not determine completely effective demand. You have investment, you have consumption, you have government spending. So why is it, why is it that this, this time they, come, they move closely together? <coughs> why this should not be necessarily the case? I will, uh, I will leave this, you this as a homework to try and see what happened in your own countries. Why is it? Do they, move, do they move in parallel or do they behave differently? And whatever the case, which would be the explanation? Okay, anyway, anyway, this suggests that the following exchange constraint was an important limit uh, an important constraint for economic growth. Now, this, uh, this takes me to the uh, final part of the, of the paper. I am, uh, it has take, taken me a bit, uh, a bit of time, too much perhaps. Is it okay? Okay. okay. Now, um, now, another paper, which you should read because it is very important, I wrote about the effect of the, the, the wage share, the changes of the wage share, or, and the effect of demand, on demand. Now, in this paper, I go to another issue. So, namely, why is it that the import coefficient grew so much? Now, because you see, as I. Uh, why? Mexico was a large exporter. Export <coughs> grew very, very much. Why rate of the, the, the huge rate of growth of exports did not bring about faster rate of growth of output? My brief answer to that, the import coefficient rose extremely fast. And this is a central issue. To come to this issue, I don't know. Well, you, you, uh, I will. I will tell you the the, num the numbers more or less. Now, there is a, the, 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 there is a, uh, an idea um, in, in most uh, of the Mex Mexico's discussion that this was a consequence of the shift of the demand or growth towards imports, toward export. Excuse, excuse, excuse me. So the idea is that since exports 
grew very fast. Since nowadays, exports are manufactured to a large extent using imported inputs, the fast growth of rate of growth of export generated a great demand for imported inputs. So when Mexico turned into an, an important exporter of, exporter of manufacturers, this naturally raised the import coefficient overall because exports are very import dependent in almost all countries of the world nowadays. Now, to, to, to assess to what extent this is a good explanation, a complete explanation, because one cannot deny that in general in Mexico, <coughs> manufacturing exports are made up, are made with many, many imported components and inputs. I made a comparison between the experience of three large middle income uh, exporters, Mexico, Korea, and China. Mexic uh, Korea and China are very, very important exporters. The rate of growth of manufacturing exports of China, of course, and Korea also, are very, very, very great, greater than Mexico's, which has also a rate of growth of export quite high. But these two countries have, have achieved a very high rate of growth of output, while in Mexico, which is also an important exporter, and where exports also grow very fast, did not grow that fast. Now, but the important result, which was unexpected for me, is that, in fact, the import coefficient of the export sector is not much different between Mexico and the other two countries, which means that it was not the huge rise in the rate of growth of exports which can explain the rise in the overall import coefficient of the Mexican economy. The rise in the export coefficient was mainly due to the opening up of the country to uh, imports, which made that now a large part of consumption and spending in general, in domestic spending, is, is uh, made with imported inputs. It is not that imports enter directly into consumption. It is that consumption goods are made with a large import component nowadays. The share, the share of imports, the share of, uh, of, of uh, intermediate imports in the case of Mexico is about 85%. Now, given this, the, uh, the, uh, the normal, the usual, the usual solution seems to be to achieve competitiveness through devaluation. This is what it immediately is said. Look, if you want to grow fast, you need to have your uh, external accounts balanced. And to have this, you need to have a competitive exchange rate. So then, to grow faster, you need to devalue your currency. Now, this is the normal, the usual solution which is proposed. Now, look. Now, uh, and because... Now, look. For this, I, 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 I 
I prefer three sorts of simulations. Suppose the country, the, the government, want to achieve, ab abandons <coughs> its austerity view and proposes to grow fast through government expenditure, for example. What would be the result? Of course, the result of this would be uh, that the trade balance in this lapse of time would turn extremely negative, 21% of GDP. This is unsustainable. No country can have, can, uh, can, can reach this amount of uh, external uh, deficit. So this, this option, option of growing, of pushing the economy to grow with the same um, pattern of growth would, is doomed to failure because the external account turned extremely negative. You see the idea? Because of the huge import elasticity of GDP. Now, the second solution, as I suggested, would be a currency devaluation to make, to, to make the currency more competitive. If your competitiveness uh, through, the, through, high, through a competitive exchange rate rises, then you will turn out to be, uh, you may have um, external accounts balanced. The point, however, is, however, is this. If you devalue your currency, what would be the, the, the effect of this? Have you any idea? Currency devaluation, which is uh, the consequence of this? Inflation. Huh? Inflation. What more? Inflation, of course. This is immediate. What else happens? if you devalue your currency. What happens with the real wage? Since, since the price of imports grow, the domestic price of import grows, all prices are going to rise. See? So then you have either inflation, persistent inflation, because of, 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 of a wage price spiral, or if, wages, if workers do not or cannot react, you have a huge fall in the real wage, which depresses demand besides the socio-political problems. Now, uh, then, and I estimated what would happen if the government pursues an expansionary policy or a competitive exchange rate policy through devaluation and to uh, offset the effect of the fall in uh, workers' demand on effective demand, it increases its own spending. I understand the point? Namely, since you know or you feel that you are going to depress demand if you devalue your currency, in order to offset this, you uh, expand government, government spending. Okay? What would be the consequence of this? A, a, a policy of government expansion come, uh, in, come, come uh, exchange rate devaluation. Now, you see, the real wage index would fall about one third. So this might be done, but it has to be done with bayonets because it, it's not going to be accepted. We had an experience. <laughs> now, so an alternative scenario would, exp would require a whole shift, a whole change in the growth pattern, uh, which is another issue uh, which must be simulated 
but I would I, I, I do not want to go into this because it's already too much to have to discuss. And this would be the end of the story. Okay? Okay, so now let's do our presentation based on the paper by the professor. Um, well, first we have our outline. We are going to talk about some distributional issues, the political economy, aspects of NAFTA. We are going to carry out an important de de import decomposition, the Mexican economy. And well, let's start. And also some recent trends that have been in Mexico. Uh, well, uh, as the professor mentioned, uh, in past he, uh, the prof uh, wage-led debate in Mexico, he found uh, Mex that Mexico's national demand and the GDP growth are both wage-led, uh, in other works. Uh, another very important paper on this debate, Onar and Galani, found that Mac domestic demand, yes, it's wage-led, but the overall, but when accounting for the external sector, you, uh, the total demand turns into profit-led. Uh, as I said, it's a debate. Uh, and well, uh, going a bit further on the on what he presented, he mentioned the the scenarios uh, here with us. Basically, the, the scenario which we avoid uh, the exchange rate leading to a, f a fail of the real wage and also keeping a trade uh, balance is this was the third scenario, which is the productivity growth rate of uh, four percent a year which in, even in the paper uh, you discuss how difficult it is to, to get this a productive growth rate of 4% a year, which helps us to make a clearer picture of uh, some structural constraints which are faced by Mexico in its uh, growth tra uh, trajectory. Um, so now, now let's turn to some data. How did the wage really evolve recently? Uh, well, first of all, you can see here that uh, the Mexico's workers are not only the, uh, the ones who have been worse since the, uh, the crisis in the emerging G20 cri countries, but are basically the only ones who experienced a decrease on their purchasing power. All the others had at least some increase and the Mexico's decreased. Um, well, furthermore, uh, Cushing and Thompson, they analyzed the process of financialization that the, the global economy has been going through, and they say that not only the level of wages uh, decreased, as we saw, also uh, the inequality within the working class, which, which is the wage dispersion, and the inequality on functional terms also increase. Uh, here we have the wage share that the professor uh, uh, had already shown some, some data. We can see it here uh, for Mexico, according to what the professor said, better to compare uh, with Turkey. Uh, well, uh, moreover, uh, we, can, we can go now to the personal, to the personal distribution, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what we can see here, this is the market distribution, it's not the final distribution of income, is that uh, the elites, they, they increase it, they have been increasing the, their part on the national income um, at the expense, basically, of the lowest bottom of the Sorry, the half, uh, the, the bottom half of the population, uh, while the middle class mainly managed to keep the, that part on the on the national income. And um, well, <coughs> how the population in Mexico sees it, we can see that for uh, that the perception of the population regarding uh, the distribution was changing quite a lot. In 2000, you have a, an important political party shift in Mexico, and by these years, it was changing a lot, and the trend was, has been changing a lot. But since the financial crisis, it more or less stabilized it. And also, there is no significant difference regarding gender on this perception. And mainly now, what... So based on all of this uh, scenario of income concentration in recent years of the, pop the perception of the population, what is the state really doing regarding it? Here you have a, a bit more complex uh, graph by the desires of the national income and the, um, the, the role of the state regarding uh, the market distribution that we said and the final distribution. What we can see here is that, yes, the, the state does, res does redistribute income to some extent, but I mean, just in somehow all the, the, the data, all the states that we have the overall data for it, 
do redistribute in, in somehow. But what we can see here is that uh, mainly the decile which really experiences a, a strong difference is the lowest decile of income, basically the poorest people of the country, which uh, on the assessment of the, the authors, uh, Crozer et al. And basically this is due to the social policies present in Mexico and that have been uh, implemented. A lot of uh, focalized social policies, conditional cash transfers programs, for example. And well, these, so these policies focusing on the very, very, very poor of the country, yes, they were effective uh, to, to change somehow. But what, uh, what, we can, what we can see also is that as this is the, only, the biggest effect is basically due to the social policies on the assessment of the authors. What we can see is that for the, for the other desires, there is some difference, but not that much. So basically, the distribution effects of the state in Mexico is due to the social policies. The macro policies on the, on the recent years have not been really uh, able to, to redistribute in, to a considerable extent. They have been, been failing to deal with the, the, the trends of decreasing the wage share and, and everything that have been going through on the market distribution. And I mean, this is somehow that the should have been included. Okay. Um, so, um, ah, okay. Um, uh, the Professor Lopez already uh, pointed out um, the core of, of the sole issue that uh, is that um, we had a, a massive uh, phase of trade liberal liberalization uh, in Mexico. Um, the effect was that we had um, uh, also very much increasing exports, but relatively slow growth. and. Um, now the trade liberalization started already before NAFTA, but I want to uh, focus a little bit on NAFTA because it's uh, very important for Mexico. And um, NAFTA was signed in 1994 by Mexico, Canada, and the US. And um, the main features was that uh, they agreed uh, that within 10 years, tariffs um, of goods would be abolished. Um, uh, on 99% of the goods would be abolished. There were uh, massive removals of uh, restrictions to FDIs, the protection of intellectual property rights. And uh, Professor Lopez pointed out in his paper that it mostly turned Mexico into an export platform of the US. Um, <coughs> so let's have a look on the com composition of exports. Um, it's also a little repetition of what we just heard, so I will go fast. So we have um, a lot of machines, uh, transport, um, also uh, metals, uh, chemicals, and mineral products. But um, uh, yeah, and the export composition uh, looks quite similar. So uh, what does it mean? Um, Mexico, um, or the exports are very much uh, import dependent, so we have um, huge, uh, we have a lot of um, intermediate manufacturer goods. Um, so one point is exports and imports are very highly interlinked. That <coughs> means also if you want to uh, tackle one, so we heard that the import coefficient is um, or could be uh, um, a, a determinant for, for um, potential growth. So uh, if you want to affect uh, one, you will al always affect uh, the other. And um, also, um, um, which is a reason is also that Mexico is uh, just a low-cost um, manufacturing, uh, is an offshore platform for manufacturing of the U.S. We have, um, as Matthias told you, uh, very low labor costs, but we have still an abundance of qualified labor. And also we have uh, the um, yeah, structural setup, so um, infrastructure is well developed, but also uh, like the, the, um, the regulatory setting is, um, yeah, we have some export processing zones, we have tax breaks, and so on. <coughs> Um, and who is Mexico exporting and or who is Mexico trading with? It's the United States, obviously. Um, but so, for example, there are almost 80% of the exports are going to the United States and Canada. Uh, but what are the implications uh, politically? Um, uh, the United States has huge power over Mexico when it comes to negotiations. Uh, we would raise that point. So. Um, if Mexico don't want to uh, lose their export sector and or risk the export sector, their profits in the export sector, and also the jobs in the export sector, 
So we all know that's not a complete uh, economic argument, but politically that's always very uh, efficient. And the last point uh, I want to raise is there will come a new uh, trade agreement, possibly. Um, it's the United States, Mexico, Canada uh, trade agreement, and the Democrat, well, the, the, the American Congress uh, still has to ratify it, but it's possible that it will come. Uh, from my viewpoint, there were no major changes to NAFTA, but um, still uh, some wage standards were implemented. Um, so, for example, 40 to 45 percent of the automobile parts have to be made by workers who earn uh, at least $16 an hour by 2023. Um, then there are some uh, advantages, for advantages for the U.S. Uh, regarding the Canadian dairy market, and also even stronger intellectual property rights and digital trade rights. So our question uh, to you would be, uh, what is in it for Mexico? What may be the uh, effects on the Mexican growth past? Will there be any effects? And uh, very interesting, I think, is also uh, we just, uh, there's just a new president elected in Mexico. Um, he has a very long name. He is called <laughs> An just Andres as, Manuel just as Lopez every one of us. <laughs> <laughs> And <laughs> Um, also, I would, uh, hear, would like to hear your opinion on uh, his, his view of uh, the current austerity in Mexico. And the, and the gilet jaune? <laughs> <laughs> um, because uh, the president, uh, I think, uh, wants to keep uh, the current austerity policies. And um, uh, what, what you uh, have shown us, um, it's maybe even in line with your prognosis that... Um, devaluation and austerity might not even, and abolishing austerity might not even be effective for output growth, but yeah, maybe you can give us some thoughts about that uh, later. Um, so we finish with the comments and then we'll be glad to hear your opinion. Um, I'd like to discuss a bit, um, well, what you were saying, the importance of, uh, the Im of why the import coefficient is so high in Mexico. And a few years ago, in the CEPAL office in Buenos Aires, uh, the ICLAC, we made an import decomposition uh, for both, well, well, for Chilean, Mexican, and Brazilian economy, test checking how much, with the input output matrices, checking how much of the imports were related to each component of aggregate demand. So, like to give a general broad picture to everyone also, usually what we look at GDP is the four demand components, comp uh, consumption, government expenditures, investment, and net exports. So we kind of implicitly assume that like the trade balance as a whole in order to understand what's going on with the effect of net exports on demand. But it's not really fair or it's not really correct uh, in, in empirical terms to assume that all imports are related to exports. Actually, we can decompose imports using input-output techniques and obtain four components, uh, which are the imports related to consumption, the import related to government expenditures, the import related to investment, and the import related to exports. And these imports include both intermediate and final inputs. Uh, so we can account for all the imports of an economy considering how much considering to which component of area demand do they respond. So therefore we can rethink growth considering each component of area demand net of imports. And I'd like to show you the coefficients for Mexico uh, in, to have as a comparison both Chile and Brazil. And this you should focus probably in the total row. Uh, so we can see that for Brazil, for example, the import coefficient is 10%. Well, for Mexico is 23, and for Chile is even higher, it's 20, uh, 28. But in the case of Mexico, this responds mainly to a really high uh, coefficient on exports. So 43%, I mean, of each dollar of exports, Mexico has to import 43 cents uh, of imports in order to produce it. And it's mainly intermediate goods, as you can see here, um, which is much, much higher, pardon? Oh. Oh, yeah, because they are different denominators. I mean, the, in term, the final one, you remove it from total uh, exports, and then the, you take 40% out of what's left of it. Uh, but it's just a technicism. Um, and we can see that it's much, much higher than both Chile and definitely Brazil, a much more uh, industrialized and integrated economy, although our Brazilian colleagues don't like that expression here. Um, 
And the investment is also very, very high. 30% uh, of the investment in, in Mexico turned out to be imported. Of course, these are values of 2008, so uh, I mean, we only have input output matrices uh, for every, I think in Mexico it's five years, if I'm not wrong. Uh, although it's, well, definitely higher than, than Chile, than Brazil, but lower than, than Chile. And I think, so, well, this is, definitely not in line with, with what you were saying before, so if you can make some comments on it, because here an increase on exports would, I mean, following these numbers, an increase on exports on GDP or an increase on investment on GDP would raise the, the import coefficient. Um, and I think that's something also interesting and that goes in line with what you were saying is that still the import coefficient, both directly and indirectly, of public expenditure is quite low, which doesn't undermine much uh, the possibility of a fiscal expansion. It doesn't undermine the multiplier. Um, and here we can see the growth, the year-per-year -year growth uh, of Mexico with the traditional and with the alternative method. Um, so the traditional, we see that exports contributed like every year uh, on a GDP growth of 1.5% and consumption at one8 more or less, <laughs> while investment 0 07 and we have a huge factor of imports undermining growth. And once we decompose these imports and remove them from each component, we get here uh, that like a um, growth of around, uh, an average growth of around 2.4, 2.5% uh, was mainly due to consumption, but um, exports really decreased their participation uh, and investment basically disappears. It doesn't really add much to aggregate demand. Um, so I, th I think it's, uh, well, it's uh, just a point to discuss a bit more about why the import coefficient in Mexico has been so high in the last year as well, since the, since the change on the growth pattern. Uh, I think I'll skip this, but it's just a decomposition year by year uh, of, of growth. Once, in exports, once imports are removed from each component, I think only one highlight that should be mentioned is that sometimes our interpretation of growth changes. For example, we can see 2010 where we think that investment made a positive contribution to growth, and once we remove the imports, we find out that it's actually negative. So. I mean, especially for so highly, so for economies that are so highly dependent on imports, it's quite important to be able to decompose them and see to which demand component are they related, because if not, we can make a wrong uh, interpretation of, of what's going on with the growth of the economy. Um, so maybe do you want to present the final questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, yeah, some questions we already uh, had during the presentation, but... Uh, uh, we want to also raise this. Uh, so, considering Mexico's position, uh, NAFTA, WTO, and so on, uh, OECD, how much policy space does the country have? Um, also, also um, uh, relative to the to the high um, uh, to, to the high extent of, of exports and imports of the trading sector of the overall economy in Mexico, um, what effect uh, will the new United States, Mexico, Canada agreement have on the growth path uh, of the Mexican economy uh, once it's ratified? And uh, what are the political intentions of the new president um, regarding trade? Um, yeah, maybe you have some knowledge about that. So that's it. And um, maybe you can uh, take over now. Yes. And uh, have a comment on our presentation, and then we can open yes. the floor for everybody. In fact, <laughs> well, in fact, uh, you wrote papers yourself, so I'm a bit, uh, 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 I'm a bit of the on difficulty on, on on answering. I do not know how the procedure goes. I mean. Uh, students ask also questions no. now. No. Yes. At, after my yeah. my answer. Okay. Look, this is this is very interesting. What you have found, what you have uh, asked, and makes me uh, for a lot of thinking. And my thinking is normally very slow, uh, so I do not know if I would be able to answer. Anyway, let me try. Uh, from what I, I got from the presentation to try to give an answer to what was asked. Now, one point which appeared here refers to uh, whether, in fact, what I argued 
that Mexico is a wage-led growth country is true or is it not true? Uh, this is a very, uh, this is a, from a certain extent, this is a relatively difficult question to answer. Normally, this is, you know, this is a matter of, of debate. And if you look to the uh, literature on the issue, you will find very difficult results, even among even for, for, for studies dealing with the same country and even for authors sharing the same outlook. I mean, for example, among post keynesian authors, which is my tribe, my tribe uh, we find different results. Now, now uh, why? Why is it the case? And wha what can I say about Mexico? About Mexico, I have debated with many colleagues about this issue, um, uh, which, is, which has two phases. On the one hand, do a rise in the wage share stimulate growth or, or not? And related, do a competitive exchange rate stimulates growth or not? My short answer is that Mexico, as many other countries, is a wage rate growth. And why do I stick to this point? Look, when you do, when you do empirical studies, you have to be very careful about your econometric methodology. When you do econometrics, and you have a course on econometrics here, I, I, I hope, I'm not sure. when, when you do econometrics, you are not adjusting a curve. You are making a statistical inference, which is another animal. When you do econometrics, you are applying statistical methods to a series of variables which are supposed to be random variables. So that you have, you, you have to take care that your assumptions that you make when estimating your model are validated statistically. And I have spent a lot of time and I have been um, helped by people who know well the issue to say that the inferences I have carried out are statistically valid. So the first thing you have to do when you check for statistical results coming from econometric modeling, you have to check where the statistical assumption, the statistical and the probabilistic assumptions of the estimated model are valid. If they are not valid, then square R squared or whatever does not give you any information. You cannot accept that at face value. So this is the reason why I am so confident about my results. And which is, this is also the reason why I, I have quarreled with many of my colleagues. You have to know econometric well. You have to, to have a strong statistical basis. Otherwise, you are not going to achieve results. And since you are young, this is the advice. Try and work with someone who knows well statistics. Because this is a difficult subject. You can spend whole life doing that. My experience is that I spent a lot, I spent many, many years studying, and finally I decided that I had, I had to work with someone who is a professional on this issue. Okay, now this is this goes to the first question. This is so I can I, I can put to test my results regarding this issue, and let me in, let me. Uh, uh, th uh, expand on it. 
I have done I have carried that studies for at least six countries, namely Mexico, um, France, Germany, Great Britain, uh, and the United five countries, United States. And in all the cases, I found that growth was wage rate. There may be exceptions, because this is not given by God. This depends on the particular configuration of the country. But in my findings, this is what I found. Now, this is one point. Uh, about, the, uh, about the Mexico's full, uh, uh, about Mexico income distribution. Look, this is a difficult point uh, because Mexico statistics regarding income distribution are not much reliable, are not very reliable. Because you see, in Mexico, the rich people, which is a minority, do not appear normally in the statistics. The richest 1% or 0.5% do not appear in the statistics. And the poor do not appear in the statistics. So personal income distribution is difficult to, uh, uh, to be sure about. Now, now regard, regarding the wage share, there are, more there are also very many doubts. Uh, this has an influence, naturally, on the pattern of personal income distribution. And uh, um, I would add to what was said, with which I, I agree. Uh, I do not, I have seen, I have not studied myself what have been the consequences of financialization of income distribution. Therefore, I cannot answer this point. I can, I can give a partial answer regarding other <coughs> questions which is related to income distribution. Look, uh, I, found, I, I, I carried out a study to see which are the determinants of the wage share of the evolution of a wage share to try and find out why it had declined so much, which are the reasons. And I found that one important determinant, you know which are the determinants of wage in general. So you, we can name a few. For example, when, our, when the economy is growing, workers, per, uh, worker, workers bargaining power uh, improves they can ask for higher wages, and firms can grant them higher wages because they, they, they are getting more money. And this is one factor. We know this is one factor. When the economy is growing, wages tend to grow. But what are the other factors? I found that in Mexico's case, and probably in other countries too, maybe, uh, one important determinant of the evolution of wages is the minimum wage. And accordingly, and following this idea, which is statistically tested with my strong statistical results, uh, this implies that if the government has the capacity to fix wages, to fix the minimum wage, this has a very important impact on the evolution of average wages. I don't know if you see my point. Do you get it? See? You see, if, the government, if the government has the capacity to set the minimum wage, then it has the capacity to set the evolution of average wages. And the fall in the average wage in Mexico and the fall in the wage share in Mexico has been greatly conditioned by the fall in the minimum in the minimum real wage. So this is a very important factor. And uh, I, I, I coming to this, uh, uh, I, I will tell you something which is which is uh, might be uh, a bit uh, interesting. You see. Uh, I was once discussing with, with Brazilian colleagues and about 
uh, how, how had been the changes of income distribution in Brazil. And the colleagues I, I was discussing with were very skeptics about the redistributive effort, efforts of the Lula government. Because they told me, look, uh, the only change which has been has been that they have taken, taken the one percent, the one percent which receive the upper crust, the, the, the richest ten percent. Hmm, they took one per, one percent of the in total income that they received the rich, and they put it into the power, the, 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 low, the lowest decile. So they transfer. They transfer the one percent from the rich to the poor. Okay, so this is nothing. Now, I went to the, to see the figures, and you see, uh, the rich in Brazil they receive about forty-eight percent of the total income. Okay, the poor receive about one point two percent of total income. So, if you take the one percent here, and you put it here, then you are going to double the income received by the ten percent poorest. So this is huge. So, in, in this case, therefore, the magnitude of the figures is very important. It's very, very, and one of the reasons why, for example, during the Lula government in Brazil income distribution improved considerably was because the minimum wage was raised. This has a very important impact because people at the bottom are normally who, those who receive the minimum wage. Okay. Uh, uh, now, another point has to be uh, about the uh, the issues relating to the um, characteristic of export or, or of Mexico's exports. Uh, I thank very, I thank you very much for the reference and the estimates about the uh, the impact of uh, imports going to the uh, export sector. Uh, the figures. I showed you a bit, a, bit, a bit before. Those figures come from a very careful study having used to recent statistics. So they are, diff they are re relatively different. <coughs> Not exactly, but anyway, it is certainly the case that the export sector is extremely import intensive. There is no doubt about this. And normally also, especially in the type of countries I am discussing about, uh, also the, um, the, uh, the, the investment demand is uh, highly import intensive. Now, this being the case, it is certainly also the case that the shift or the change in the pattern of aggregate output and aggregate demand in favor of <coughs> exports tends to raise the import coefficient. Now, uh, this is uh, of course true, but in this respect, Mexico is not a case apart. It's not a case apart. See, for uh, as I show you, the import coefficient of the export sector in Mexico is similar to the Chinese uh, export sector and is the coefficient of, of import for ex Mexican exports is lower than Korea's. So the point I wanted to raise is not to discuss or to say something different about the import coefficients of the export sector. 
It was rather to put forward the question of why in Mexico, as contrasted with Korea and China, this um, export-led pattern, uh, export pattern of growth was not bringing about a gain, net gain in foreign currency. And this is not because of the, of the export sector, because export, by definition, bring in more foreign currency than, than, than they spend in imports. OK? The point, then, is why the import coefficient overall in the whole economy in Mexico grew so fast. And the reason I, 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 I gave in the paper, and I will tell you, is that the fact that in, uh, uh, opening up the country to imports affected the whole economy, and import penetration uh, brought about a decline in domestic production of competitive goods. So the domestic sector was, to, to a certain extent, ruined by import competition. OK? Uh, can, I, can I have a question in between? Uh, so I totally agree. But maybe can you have a word on the uh, income elasticity of demand of the imports? Because maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but I think that's quite high in Mexico. And that might explain the third world's external uh, uh, equilibrium uh, yeah. uh, you, are you are quite right. The figures I, 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 I show you here, income elasticity of the import is about 3.3 .3 in Mexico. In Korea and China, it is about 1.5. So income elasticity of, sim uh, of imports is very high. But I insist, to the, I insist on, on, on the fact that this is not due exclusively to the shift in the composition of production toward in favor of exports. There is a huge uh, uh, amount of imports demanded by the uh, dom domestic-oriented uh, sector. OK, this is this is one. Now, uh, is it there? Yeah. OK. okay. Uh -huh. uh, now, uh, to what extent this is due to the fact that exports are mainly done by multinationals? I do not know. I do not know. This is a point that would be, uh, be interesting uh, to, 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 to study. But I think that this, uh, this pattern where exports have a high import content is generally in the whole world today. And this is a change which has taken place during the last 20, 30 years. This is the various chains now are very much internationalized. And this is overall. This you find here in France, you find in England, you find everywhere you will find that. And this, is, this takes me to another difference which you pointed out about the difference between Mexico, for or the high import content of exports in Mexico exports, <coughs> and the relatively minor import contents of exports from Brazil, on from uh, which was the other country? Chile. Chile. Why? Look, the main reason is that Mexico, ex, ex, Mexican exports are about 85% manufacturers. Brazil exports are about how much? I think 30% manufacturers Maximum. at most. In Chile, it oh. must be about 20% yeah. manufacturing. So manufacturing demands a very high coefficient of imports. Manu exporting manufacturers requires a lot of imports. Exporting agricultural goods 
you can do practically without any any imports or the service sector even. Okay, so this this is an important difference. When Mexico turned into a manufacturing exporter, which is something very few believed, very few thought that Mexico would be able to turn in himself into a large manufacturing exporter. We did not believe that, and I particularly thought this was impossible. But this happened in a five years, ten years. Mexico turned into manufacturing exporters thanks to the fact, to a large extent, that it allowed imports of intermediate inputs. But things, not only intermediate imports, could be imported, but also final goods and imports for the do domestic consumption, then this is which brought about the rise in the import coefficient. Now, uh, now uh, there are questions. Ne the, next, uh, the, the next question referring to points I have not a clear or a very, very well thought opinion about. Uh, you see, but uh, when NAFTA was enacted, or before that, there is, a, there is a large discussion about the effect of NAFTA on Mexico, the free trade. How much, how important was this, and if this ex explain uh, a large part of Mexican evolution. I am not so sure of that. You see, Mexico big, Mexico's big change began before NAFTA, when trade liberalization took place, and this was between 85 or 87. And Mexico began to turn into a, a, a great manufacturing importer, exporter in the early, early 90s, before, enacted, uh, before NAFTA was enacted. Uh, so the changes coming from NAFTA were not as important as the policy decision to fully integrate Mexico into, into the world economy, a part of which was surely NAFTA, but was not the whole of it. Now, uh, and how are things going to change uh, with this new pact? You said rightly that the new pact is not that different from the one that was before. Uh, I do not think that Na th this new pact is going to greatly change how things are, go are going on. Now, regarding this, uh, I would add that uh, when Na Na NAFTA was enacted, there were, were, there were many of us who were quite opposed to this because we thought that this would limit this put limits to the possibility of implementing uh, alternative economic policies in Mexico. You see, NAFTA would bring about many constraints more than the economy already had because of the different uh, aspects it covered regarding trade uh, protection, regarding investment protection, and all that. Now, I am now. Uh, I have now a, a more, I would say, a nuanced opinion regarding that. You see, <coughs> and this is related also up with the questions which, uh, uh, which are how much policy space Mexico has. Uh, this is a point I am, I would say, I have not studied in detail. My opinion, in any case, is that once you, you start looking and the economic policies implemented, you realize that within the same 
framework within the same uh, legal framework of constraints, limitations, and possibilities, you could have followed different policies. So my view is that there is, in general, and in Mexico's experience, it, there has been a lot more of policy space than which was used by policymakers and by the government. You have a lot, if, for example, uh, I have been studying, I, 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 I was studying recently uh, a study on uh, the uh, constraint imposed by the autonomy of Mexico Central Bank on the government. This is considered to be a, in, an important limitation, and it is certainly a limitation. But what the study I consulted showed was that Mexico, the, Mexico's, you see, autonomy of the central bank implies, in general, in general implies that the government cannot finance himself by uh, selling debt. Okay. So you, can, you have to ask the permission to the central bank that he, uh, to give you the money. Now, but uh, this, this research I am referring to showed in Mexico's experience that the resources, the, 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 the money <coughs> which the Mexican government had in the vaults of the central bank were much larger than what the government used. So the government could have, have spent much more without asking the permission of the central bank. And so the, therefore, even though the constraint exists, you were but much below the constraint in, the in, in, in your policy or in your, in your spending policy. And regarding, regarding the um, the, this limitation imposed by NAFTA in the at the time um, by the new TAF NAFTA recently, I once was, this, was studying this issue and I asked uh, to uh, uh, a, 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 a trade lawyer specialized in these issues about uh, the uh, limitations that NAFTA imposed. And he told me the story. Look, look he told me. The government has a lot of elbow room to implement policies as much as the United States government implements without constraint deriving from NAFTA. So the point I want to, I want to put forward is that not always the lack of uh, policies is due to the lack of legal possibilities. In general, it is because policy makers in rule have a, a, have a certain viewpoint about how to conduct the, uh, how, to, how to carry out economic policies. Now, uh, the, last, the last issues. Okay. Maybe we can set aside these questions and, uh, because we have only an extra half an hour. So it would be nice to give the chance okay. for people. I don't know, because maybe probably there are a lot of questions. Sorry, No, no, no. So who? Okay. And is, is it okay if we collect uh, three questions? I will take time, and then you answer. I will see if I can answer. Because <laughs> it's not so e that easy. Well. Thank you for your presentation, first of all. Uh, my name is Eduardo. I'm from track B here in the program, which means microeconomy, finance, and political economy. And the life, <laughs> and life itself. Yeah, and life itself. <laughs> and um, I wanted to ask, the question I wanted to ask is uh, regarding uh, rent flows, uh, rent outflows, so like payment, uh, dividend payments, and uh, re uh, profit, profit remittances and interest payments. 
so uh, in the uh, uh, external equilibrium growth rate that you use in your model, are you accounting for these things or are you accounting just for capital inflows in the, the capital account? And uh, regarding to that, uh, it's like a curiosity. If you know w what are the figures for rent outflows in the period, so since you have like an important uh, participation of uh, um, foreign uh, transnational corporations in, in Mexico economy, uh, it would be possible that uh, rent outward rent flows increase in period, and that could also be interesting to look at. Well, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sofia. Uh, I'm from Option A, which is the Knowledge and Innovation Policies. Um, I just wanted to ask you to comment on the incorporation of technology into production and uh, in both of like products and services in Mexico, and, and perhaps how intellectual property rights uh, haven't had an effect on this. Uh, thank you. I'm Ron uh, from uh, Option C, Development Economics. And you mentioned the mechanism of, uh, of devaluation, that it might have some negative effects. So can you explain again the mechanism and uh, describe other problems that may arise from uh, devaluation, in develop especially in developing countries? Okay, so I, I take the three questions, yes. yeah, yeah. And, then the and, then we, uh, and then we and then we go on. Now, uh, this is an interesting question. I do not have a very uh, a good answer yet, but I will try. Look uh, about outflows. I did not have the figures to measure that. I only took net. So the, 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 the equation, I, the, 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 sh the graph I showed you about the, um, uh, the, 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 the external constraint, see, the, the, the upper part, I added up uh, exports plus investments, new investment, net investment flows. I did not have figures. Uh, I am sure they, they, they exist, but I did, I did not uh, go into that to capital outflows. Look, now, uh, these are important capital outflows because, in general, most of exports I carried out my multinationals. So studies which I have seen which I do not remember now, but which uh, I could eventually look for if you are interested in to, uh, in, in to get, go into this, uh, would show that a large part of, uh, there is a large offset to uh, investment inflows owing to capital outflows. This should be measured. I did not, I hope you will do it for me. So this is my co short answer, which is poor. I understand. I, 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 I. Now, incorporation of technology. Now, uh, you see, uh, Mexico has, from being a middle-income economy, Mexico has a, 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 has a relatively good uh, innovation capacity I, at home. The point is that, ha, uh, that exports are not leaving much in the form of knowledge because there is not a, a, a specific policy. There has been no policy regarding technology transfer for, export, for ex exporting firms. So that most Techno uh, technological knowledge is not appropriated by the country. If you compare Mexico's situation, uh, which, 
with what it was before when there was a, a, a requirement until the, uh, the, uh, the early 80s, Mexico had a very, very uh, careful um, policy with respect to allowing foreign investment into the country, demanding that a part of the technology and knowledge was, uh, was redistributed into the country. This is the policy, for example, that for a long period had Korea, and this is the policy which China has, which is bringing about problems with the United States now. Mexico never had that. And never, well, Mexico no, has not had, had that since the 80s. So there is not much uh, learning by selling, so to speak, learning by exporting. There is, of course, some, no some knowledge which gets into the country. For example, Mexico has a very important uh, inborn industry, maquiladoras is the name, namely industry which were, uh, now everyone, uh, all industries are, are like that, but before NAFTA, there were industries which were in the country and which could export under very favorable conditions to the United States and which had very favorable conditions for, uh, uh, for tax, tax conditions. Yes? And the attempt was never made to demand to these industries to have linkage, technological linkages. For, you see, for example, uh, as a comparison, Korea, you see, the automobile in industry in Korea, they use a lot of imported input. But when uh, uh, Korea, Korea firms invest in, in other countries, Asian countries mostly, they bring with them the suppliers, Korean suppliers. So this is a very integrated sector. Now, the third point was the, 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 the effects of, of, the, of, of currency depreciation. Now, this is a point I, I, I can say a bit more because I have studied it. And as I said, the results that I have, I have found is that uh, there is normally a contractionary demand effect of currency depreciation. I will go into this a bit uh, with, a, with a couple of equations. You have the equation Look, this is the demand, effect, uh, the, the demand equation I showed you before, and this is Kaleski's wage share equation. You have studied it. In any case, I will repeat because it, it, it will be useful here. This is here the K factor, is the what Kaleski called the monopoly, the, the degree of monopoly, which is very similar to the unit profit margin. And this is the rate, the ratio between raw material costs and labor costs. Okay? So this is namely this is this is the average price, and this is the unit cost. And here, this is a material costs, namely in, in, in intermediate inputs, and this is total wages paid. Now, 
what happens when you devalue your currency? It depends on what happens in the degree of monopoly or in the profit margin, and it depends on what happens in the J factor here, and it depends also on the this this numerator. It is generally presumed that when the Marshall-Lennard conditions is satisfied, namely when currency depreciation brings about a rise in the trade balance, this will bring about a rise in effective demand. Yes? I rep is it clear or not? Are you clear over there? Is it clear or, or, or I repeat? Okay? So, if the tr normally the argument is when the Marshall Lerner condition is satisfied, then you raise effective demand because you raise this. Now, when you devalue, it is not only that you improve competitiveness, it is also, once you devalue, that the uh, the degree of monopoly may change, namely the price cost ratio may change, and the ratio of raw material cost to total wage cost may change. Okay? And besides that, there is an additional effect I am going to speak about a bit later. Okay? Now, what is it? What, I, what I ha, have I found in studies I have carried out? Most of them from Mexico. Look, on the one hand, when you devalue your currency in a country which has a, long, uh, a large share of exports and imports, <coughs> exporters will maintain their price in dollars, say, foreign currency. <coughs> this is normally what happens. Now, if they keep their prices in dollars, and when you devalue, and wages do not rise, then the, the price cost ratio will rise because the only costs that will rise will be the cost of imported inputs. The cost of wages will not rise. Therefore, there is a tendency when you devalue your currency to a rise in the degree of monopoly. The profit margin, at least, in Mexico's case, for which I had carried out the study, an empirical study, I, I, I found out unexpectedly, incidentally, that the price cost ratio rises. So this is a factor which tends to reduce the wage share. Concurrently, when you devalue and wages do not rise, then the price the cost of imported raw materials will rise. And this, this factor will rise. Therefore, you have two effects here which tend to bring about a decline in the wage share. And I, am, I would bet you, whatever you want, if you want to bet with me, that you will find this type of situations everywhere. Try it with your countries. See what happens with the way we share once currency is depreciation. This is almost mechanical, okay? And since this is the case, this is going to, this is going 
to rise. If this that does not change, or if this changes not much, you will have a decline in effective demand. Now, but there is more, more to that. Normally, all firms have, or well, Mexican firms, particularly large firms, they indebt themselves partly in foreign currency. Uh, and incidentally, this is not a tropical disease. This happens also in France. Firms get indebted in foreign currency, particularly now due to the financialization of the economies. They look where uh, interest rates are the lowest, which is normally in the world you can find. So you indebt yourself in dollars. Okay. Now, consider the situation of a firm which, ha which has dollar debt. Once you devalue your currency, immediately your balance shift turns negative. Because you have debt which you, ha you have to serve at a higher price in domestic currency. The dollar price remains the same but you have to pay more domestic currency per dollar. So, the, therefore, what I have found, and which is what was to a certain extent unexpected, is that currency depreciation also tends to negatively affect investment. Because a balance sheet of firms uh, Turns, turns negative. So this is a very important effect, and I am sure, again, and I would bet you, that if you study your countries, you are going to find that. See, in the world which is financialized now, you have, the, the, uh, you have debt in foreign currency, normally in dollars. And this is the reason why currency depreciation is not that magnificent option. If you devalue, you have to take into account that and to take countervailing measures. Okay. Okay, I'll try to keep it short then. So thank you very much, Professor Lopez. Hi, hi, hi. So thank you very much, Professor Lopez, for your intervention. I'm Louis from option B as well, uh, from France. Uh, I have a very quick question um, about uh, what, what about transfer prices? Because uh, what? about transfer prices, because that kind of accounting tricks can lead to distortions in the computation of, in, of um, trade deficits uh, and import prices in general. So we have that kind of illusion. For, I mean, there, are, there is proof that there, there is that kind of illusion between France and Germany, for instance. Something, I mean, a sizable part of the French deficit towards Germany being attributable to transfer price tricks. Uh, what, what if it's the case for Mexico? What if this increase is the um, import coefficient um, nominal in the sense that it's about uh, U.S. companies, because 50% of so import, I mean, Mexican imports are from the U.S. That's Mexican, uh, no, sorry, U.S. firms, trend, I mean, uh, re-import or repatriate their profits and therefore charge higher margins and that therefore there is a nominal effect rather than a real effect. Shall I? Thank you. Yes. Shall I? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Look, uh, I, I, I have been reading the same literature you have been uh, regarding France. I know Askenazi, in particular, has, uh, has studied the issue for France. I do not know of studies for Mexico. I do not think they w should be as important as they are in France. Because, you see, Mexico's... Um, tax on profits is below tax on profits in the United States. So that firms prefer to stay in Mexico 
where they pay lower taxes than in the United States. So you see, that w what, you were, what you were saying is that if firms pay lower taxes in France and Germany, if firms pay lower taxes in Germany, they will, they will put the uh, <coughs> tax uh, accounts into Germany. Yes? Because of this. Now, in Mexico, Mexico taxes on profit are, are low. Therefore, firms find it, m I think, this is a pure guess, huh? firms f would find more convenient to be taxed in Mexico and therefore to have the siege uh, in Mexico than in the United States. But I have not st studied the issue or read about the issue in Mexico. I, I do not think that I, there are studies, and the first one I saw was the French one by Askenazi. Uh, okay, so I would like to, we, we would like to thank you a lot, uh, Professor Lopez, to thank the coordination of IPOG by the organization of it. And yeah.